Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, it is Thursday morning, and we have um, we have dedicated the next three hours or so to hearing um, other folks put ideas on the table. Um, we uh, we aim to be good listeners and ask clarifying questions of the different folks who are bringing ideas in front of us. Um, and also we'll ask folks to please uh, stick to the principle of presenting their own idea as opposed to um, uh, spending time remarking on other ideas that have gone on the table. And so um, we are, are going to hear a broad range of ideas from a broad variety of, of folks from inside the legislature, as well as um, some folks from outside the legislature. So uh, our first presentation this morning is Representative Beck from St. Johnsbury. And I believe you're going to be talking about your H-119. Are you also talking about the short form bill that you are still have in the works? I, I can speak to both, but I'll start with 119. All right, you've got the floor and uh, please leave about 10 minutes for questions if you can. Okay, so how much how much time do you wanna spend on this total? Uh, 30 minutes total. Okay, all right, so, um, I'll, be, I'll be quicker than 20 minutes. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, House Bill 119 is a, um, a, a bill to um, address the the same problem that this committee is trying to address, which is the unfunded liability and the uh, ADEC payments that continue to increase. Um, I'll just go through the bill uh, real quick and then get to a little bit of the why, and then we'll get into questions. So um, section one of the bill uh, requires the, um, that the existing uh, teacher retirement system and state employee retirement system be closed to um, any new uh, active members that are vested by July 1st of 2023, and that the treasurer recommend a plan for new employees no later than December 15th of, 20, of 2021. Uh, with some constraints on that new system, uh, specifically that the new system have a separate accounting from the legacy systems, which are the systems that we're currently in right now, that they utilize the same board of trustees that the existing legacy systems use, um, that there is a recommendation for a schedule of payment through 2050 to continue to address the unfunded liability, and that, um, that the new system that um, the treasurer recommends that it not be funded by the general fund um, including the OPEB side. So it would have to be funded by the um, employees and employers, not the, not the general fund, which was how the legacy systems were supposed to work, but that's not where we ended up. Um, and then that would all be effective on July 1st of 2021. Okay, so the, um, the, the why here, um, well, let me just stop right there. Are there any questions about the, the bill itself from anybody? Anyone have any clarifying questions? Understand the objective as laid out? Okay, I'll, um, uh, I'll keep Bob going. Bob oh, has a question. Yeah. Scott, it takes too long on these things to get your hand up. Um, <laughs> are you anticipating any interference with your second suggestion of a system and the elective defined contribution systems that are available now to the state? No, I, I don't, I don't, in, in this language here, I don't predispose the, the treasurer to, you know, I know there's, there's defined benefit systems, there are defined contribution systems, there are hybrid systems out there that uh, people are using. I, I don't, I don't predispose that conversation at all. Um, she, treasurer be free to recommend whatever, you know, I suspect she'd have a conversation with the employee the employees to see what you know what their thoughts were and and uh, the heads of the different uh, the SEA and the NEA but I don't predispose that that conversation or that outcome yeah and I asked the question because and I don't know the answer to this but I yeah. have the impression that certain defined contribution systems would not be 
allowable if certain other defined conflicts just say conditions were were in existence and that's just that nexus between the two that i don't know about that i thought maybe you might yeah. have done thank you i don't and that like i said that would be for the treasurer to discover through a, a thoughtful fact finding process and listening to all the parties that are involved yep okay um Mike mccarthy uh, thanks for bringing this to us, Representative Beck. Uh, my question has to do with the um, number four. So if, if we say that all the existing unfunded liabilities, which has been sort of the focus of our conversation here is what to do about that, those looming uh, benefits costs, do you, do you have a sense uh, of what that schedule might look like? You know, this year, the amount that the state taxpayers that we all as Vermonters are going to put into the system uh, is topping the $300 million across the. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. It's kind of getting into the why here. So let me just, let me just go there. Okay. So basically, you know, I think this committee knows is that, you know, the, the real problem here that we're, we're facing is that the ADEC, um, the general fund, con the general fund portion of the ADEC it, it's scheduled to increase at 3% every year. And it, it keeps going up even faster than that. And it's just, it's just, it's just killing the, the general fund. And it's taken away a lot of resources from other things that we could be doing to solve what is really our number one problem, which is our demographics problem. So to answer your question, Representative McCarthy, if you close the system to new employees, okay, Effectively, what happens is, is that at the end of this plan, you don't have to have this huge, enormous pot of money to finance the future, because the future is they're all out of the, the system way down the road, okay? So what that allows you to do is it allows you to use the fund itself, which is over $2 billion, to help you um, keep those general fund payments down over time and possibly even spread them out over time and still meet all of the, the still being able to provide all the benefits that the employees were produced. Okay, so to directly circle back to your question, yes, it is my, it is my belief that if you, if you had an actuary look at this and said, at the end, if you know, at, at the end, you want to be at zero. Right when the last retiree, um, you know, passes, the fund should be zero because there's nobody else to to um, to support here. And if you can work that through and not be forced to have this enormous pot of money at the end, then you can bring down those those general fund contributions, and you can free up you can free up that money. Now, what would that look like? I don't know. An actuary would actually have to, to do that work. You know, you could say, hey, it's what we pay today is flat for this many years. Or you could say, you know, for the next until 2038, we don't have to grow it at 3%. We could grow it at, you know, 1% or maybe less. Um, but, it, but an actuary would actually have to figure out what that new cost schedule would be and then you'd compare it to the um, the existing, but I am confident that it would be a um, it would be a far more generous repayment schedule than what we're looking at right now because there is no requirement of require there would be no requirement to have that enormous pot of money at the end. Uh, Bob Hooper, and then we should give Scott a chance to get back to sharing any thoughts that he. Just a clarifying question, Scott. I don't have it in front of me. I'm trying to bring it up, but you mentioned yeah. $2 million, which is not the total fund that VPIC is managing. Are you proposing this only for the state employee group? No, I, um, I'm proposing it for both. That was just an example that I... Okay, okay. I, I, think this, I think the state employee fund is about the same amount of money, though. So, Okay, so I mean, I really kind of got at the why there, responding to Representative McCarthy. But basically, you know, I mean, I think it's just at this point in in, in time, you know, we are struggling mightily with this general fund contribution to the ADAC 
you know, for the purpose of building up this fund to, you know, $5.7 billion. And if we can reduce that payment and not be required in the end to have that $5.7 billion in the bank, we can use that, that existing fund balance to pay benefits. And if everybody gets paid the, the benefits that they were promised, so I look at it as it's less of a burden on the general fund. Everybody gets the benefits they were promised. You know, I think that the current, the, the, the contribution rates do need to probably go up by about a half a percent to reflect the most recent experience study and a correct normal cost, you know, and you may want to increase, you know, you, outside of this bill, but maybe increase it by some other marginal amount of, you know, a quarter or something to reflect what um, the percent of the normal costs that the employees haven't paid because we haven't adjusted the contribution rates, but I think you're talking about relatively small amounts. And then for the new employees, put together a fund, you know, a plan, the treasurer, that is, you know, really, you know, guaranteed that the normal cost will be collected. It will be the correct normal cost and that there are mechanisms in there to adjust for um, demographic trends and shortfalls in investment. You had one, one piece in the other bill I thought was a good one that, you know, there's a mechanism in there to recover. And then we, you know, we could tell the rating agencies, we could say, listen, our new employee fund has no unfunded liability. Our legacy funds are expiring and this is our strategy to, you know, to, to fully fund them, um, make sure everybody gets their benefits. But the unfunded liability is not really the issue anymore. The issue is, is we just have to pay the correct amount of money in to make sure that everybody gets their benefits. And when that last person is done, that the fund is at zero. So that's basically the the why. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Scott, nice to see you. Thanks for bringing this yeah. forward. Good to see you. Um, I have two questions. One, the uh, projected termination date of uh, 2050, that's, that's sort of a back of the envelope. When you think this will all be unwound, right? I mean, no, it's, it's actually, it's actually not. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it, you know, that's a number that that's a number that an actuary would actually, you know, make some recommendations of what actually made sense and date okay. amount in. But that number where it was chosen was um, because it was an estimate of that's when probably the last vested employee in the system right now will likely retire somewhere around that date. Okay, you said you said retire, but as you probably know, a lot of these are our life lifespan determined. So anyway, I don't want to belabor that. Yeah, but I understand no, that that's that's a difficult absolutely. target target yeah. to meet. What I really want to go on to is while you're saying that there's no presupposition about where the new plan uh, would land in terms of the choices, and that's really a, a, a deference, a delegation to the treasurer to make a recommendation. Um, I'm, I'm a little puzzled because if there's no corpus, there's no trust, there's no fund, you either start out uh, bonding to create a fund or you're on PAYGO. And it seems to me that does presuppose what the treasurer could bring forward. Could you, could you sort of work me a little bit on that? Because starting well, I, up a plan with no yeah. money means your pay go or you're somewhere else. Well, I think, you know, um, you know, I've obviously, I have never started a defined benefit plan or a defined contribution plan from scratch. Um, but when people enter into a, um, you know, these would be non-vested employees only that would be going into this plan. So obviously in the first, I mean, there'd be no, I mean, you're not going to, they're not going to be in retirement benefits paid out for a while. So you, you know, you'd have those, those beginning years to, you know, bring those normal costs in, build that fund up in anticipation that you could support the retirees, whether it's, I don't know, 
um, 10, 20, 30 years, you know, when they first start retiring the first group, okay. you would build up that, that fund. I mean, the well, normal cost would have to be correct. You know, you, the normal cost I, has to be correct. I don't want to second guess this, but you may know uh, judges may begin drawing in a very few years just because of the way the plan currently is. State police mandatory retire at 55. They may only have in 12 years. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mishmash of how long you have or how far in advance you have to start putting in. And I, I don't expect you to have thought that out. I'm just yeah. saying starting a fund is not as simple as saying, oh, I got 20 years to build up a, a trust. Um, no. I'm not sure that's so, but thank you. No, it would, it, you're right. I mean, it would certainly, I mean, you don't want me building a new fund. You know, I don't have the, I don't have the knowledge to do that. I mean, it would have to be done by professionals, um, actuaries, um, you know, there would, I mean, I, I'm sure that you don't do it in an afternoon. It's, it would have to be done thoughtfully. Anything okay. else you want to? No, I, I mean, just that I really think that, you know, the problem here is the increasing general fund contribution to the ADEC. And that's the, that's the thing that's killing us. And it's, it's preventing general from dollars from going to our really most important problem, which is solving our demographics. And if we can find a way to slow that growth in the ADEC down or flatline it or do whatever we can do and still give our, our, our employees that are in this vested the benefits that they were promised, then we've, you know, we've remained true to those, to those employees that were in this system. And, you know, we can, we can solve that growing ADEC problem. That's, that's really, really hurting us and, and holding the state back. Rob LeClaire. Um, good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Rob. Um, I, I understand the why. I'm still trying to understand the how. Um, I, I get the concept behind this, but the as you had so appropriately termed it, the legacy system. How would we go through and address the projected ADEC payments and costs for those that are in the legacy system up to, you know, say if you, if your 2030 date is correct, we're still going to deal with that ongoing thing for another 29 years. So how would, how would we address the, the ongoing, but more current expenses that are associated with that and, and funding? Well, I think the, you know, the funding, um, you have your normal cost. And we know what that is based on the experience study. We know what the normal cost is. We know what the we know what the fund balance is. It's, you know, it's a little over two billion dollars right now, and we we have an idea of the expected uh, payout of benefits over time. And then what what an actuary would do is they would look at that and they would say, okay, you've you've got this much money, you've got this. This is the payment schedule of the active employees. This is the benefit schedule of the retired members and the active members. Okay. And you want to be at $0 by the end. Okay. So what, what does the state, what does the, you know, what does the ADEC need to be for the next, whatever, you know, 20, 25, 30, whatever they recommend, what does the ADEC need to be? And then you, you know, from the ADEC, you subtract the normal cost. And that tells you what the general fund contribution is going to need to be. But an actuary would have to do that work to get, to get you that, that uh, actual number uh, that is to be repaid annually and the, the schedule over time for that payment to occur. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because uh, I think this is more of a common act because if I heard uh, one of the presenters yesterday correctly, I believe the teacher's fund is bleeding principal at about 13 million a month right now. And obviously um, this is a situation that needs to be addressed much sooner than later, but thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I, I do know the teachers fund a little bit. I think their benefits, um, 
let's see, I've got that, actually, I've got that right in front of me here. Um, the teacher's benefits in 2020 uh, were $201 million. Um, the employee contributions were 127. Our employer contributions were 127. Member contributions were 166. So that's a difference of 35 million. Okay, so where would that $35 million come from? It would have to come from the fund itself. Um, but of course that fund is growing. So the question would be whether the growth was greater than $35 million. It is, I, I don't know what the growth of the fund was last year, but it, it, is, it is possible that the growth of the fund was less than the fund contribution. Um, that, that can happen any year if, you know, if, you, if the fund has a bad year, but of course over time, you have good years and you have bad years. So I, I wouldn't say that's outside the realm of possibility. Um, could have, it could be true. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be true if the fund was what it should be, <laughs> but the fund isn't what it should be, unfortunately. If I, if I may interject, I <clears throat> asked Mr. Galanka specifically that question, and he says, no, 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 we're not eating up the uh, principal. Okay. Yeah, I mean, 30, $35 million on a $2 billion fund is only 1.75%. You know, only if you had 1.75% growth, you would cover that. 35 million. It, boy, the last year the market was really good. I would hope they made at least 1.75%, but I don't know for sure. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. As usual, the senior member from Barry asked a question that confused me. Um, <laughs> Scott, I see you've had that same experience. Um, so my impression is that, uh, you know, you're, you're, plan is that eventually the fund will go to zero balance. Yeah. Um, at this point in time, again, my impression is that the actuarial snapshot of the projected liabilities, unfunded and funded, based upon the composition of the workforce on the day the snapshot was taken, says that at the end of the career of those people that are in that particular snapshot, there's an unfunded liability that exists. So when you're talking about freeing up the general fund, you're still gonna to have to be dealing with the unfunded liability that exists from the legacy fund. So you're projecting out from the date of hire, whenever the new plan starts, everybody that is in the system before that, which will be somebody that has probably a rule of 87 or rule of 90 career ahead yep. of plus their normal retirement life. And it's, if it's a, a healthy woman, we can probably assume that's another 35 years. Uh, yeah. That's a long time that we're gonna still be basically saying to the general fund, gimme, gimme, gimme. Um, so I assume well, I'm in the assumption that we're talking a long time before this is freed up because as people continue to not pay into the legacy, um, the unfunded liability, quote unquote, is going to rely upon stock market gains and state contribution. The third leg of that stool, which is in ongoing employee contributions, is going to disappear. So quite frankly, we're, we're placing the legacy fund and its unfunded liability in a worse position over time just because of the snapshot of people that are moving forward. Yeah, I mean, well, it, well you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, that the, um, you know, if you're not letting any new people into the legacy system, then the, the, the current amount is going to decrease over time because you have fewer people in there. And that, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, so, you know, that's where the actuary will say, hey, you know, this is, this is going to be a decreasing revenue you know, contributions is going to decrease at this rate. And they're going to, yeah, they're going to have to factor that into their rec, their recommended ADEX schedule. But it's a, it's an X rated curve or graph because as employee contributions go down, as current snapshot goes out of the workforce and becomes retired and starts drawing more, it's going to fall more obligation upon the state to make up for 
what they used to be paying in, nobody's there to replace them to yeah. pay. So that that looks to me like it's going to be a, a a curve that has a pretty strong tail at the end of it. Well, only if only if the A deck is wrong. I mean, that doesn't mean that the A deck is 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 should account for all of that. You know, they they know what the the re, they know what the benefit schedule of payment is. They know what the contribution um, schedule of payment is. They know what the fund is. They know what the fund's supposed to get. I mean, yeah, they'll they will absolutely say, you know, hey, when when the um, when the last person in the workforce retires and there's no more employee contributions, this is what the fund will need to be mm-hmm. to make sure everybody gets taken care of. And yeah, they'll they'll absolutely crank that in. And, and does it force the ADEC to be higher than it otherwise normally would have been? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I no, I mean, yeah, there's no, there's no free lunches here. No, no, I mean, no. Uh, I, yeah. I, yeah. I think the point that I'm trying to get to is yeah. in the, there will be a steep drop off in general fund of availability for a while. And then at the end, it'll probably go back up again, but it's a long horizon. Yeah. It depends on, depends on what the act, I mean, like I said, the actuary could recommend, um, a, a growing payment or a decreasing payment or a flat payment, they could adjust that by a number of years. You know, I mean, that's real, that's real high level work that a, a true actuary would, would have to do. Not, Absolutely. Not, not your TI-12. Thank you. It's no. Interesting <laughs> proposal. All right. Uh, we've got three minutes. And um, so I'm going to go first to John Gannon, because Peter, you've had one question already. So we'll give John his first. And if we have time, we'll get to yours next. Go ahead, John. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Scott, for coming in today and testifying um, and bringing a new idea to us. Um, I'm looking at the the end of page two and the beginning of page three, where you say, um, okay. Uh, the state employees retirement, the, the new, the employee contribution shall not be funded by the general fund. And then you say yeah. the new systems, the cost of other pension benefits shall not be funded by the general fund. Yep. So if they're not being funded by the general fund, where's the money coming from? The employees and employers. The employer. So, okay. On the state side, the employer is the state. Right. The they have, they have special funds. Money, wouldn't it? Yep. Yep. In the case of the teacher retirement system, that's the education fund. Yep. They make the employer's cost. And then in the, uh, on the, uh, for the estate employees, there's a, a special fund that, um, that makes that payment for the state employees. Um, but yeah, what I'm talking about is the, 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 the general fund, you know, not basically from the get go, there's not, you know, we're going to set this up. So there is no unfunded liability that the general fund has to pay for. But absolutely, there will be, you know, the, I would, on the state employee side, there will be um, an, um, a fund that, that pays that portion of normal cost. Yep. No, it's, it's, not a, it's not just on the employee. Okay. But so that money, would ha- where would that money come from if it can't come from the general fund on the state employee side? Well, they have a special, they have a special fund that makes that payment. But it's not general fund. It's a special fund. It's public dollars. If that's okay. what you're getting at. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely public dollars, but it's not, it's not out of the general fund. It's out of a special fund for the purpose of making that employer portion of the state employee normal cost. But we would need to appropriate that money from somewhere. Of course. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's not free. <laughs> I mean, if, if we said the state will not pay any amount at all, then, then then it would all fall to the employee. That's not what I'm suggesting here. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, um, Representative Beck, for, for coming in and starting us off this morning. Um, a welcome, folks who have lingering questions to um, to contact Representative Beck um, via email or give him a phone call later in the day. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. All right, so I am now inviting in our 930. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair, this is quickly, this is one of those rare occasions where I'm hopefully very wrong, but the junior member from the city that I swear I heard Eric Henry say yesterday that the teachers fund is bleeding 
13, 16 million dollars a month. Did I did I not hear that? I but I recall hearing that. Um, okay. But I was I mean, slightly confused by his answer when I asked a follow up to that. So uh, that might be something worth. Mike McCarthy, do you have a recollection? Yeah, I, I don't know if if so. To I think Representative Leclerc is talking about the principal versus yes. pay, paying out from the earnings of the fund, and that might be where the distinction lies. But we we should go back and get clarity on that. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, we have Amy Town. She is the president of the Vermont State Employees Association, and they have been hard at work um, putting together a uh, potential uh, proposal here. And so welcome, Amy, and please share your thoughts with us. Are you with us, Amy? I am sorry about that. I was having some Zoom issues. Um, it's been a morning, <laughs> that's for sure. Good morning, Madam Chair and um, members of the committee. My name, for the record, is Amy Town, and I am the president of the VSEA, as well as a 21-year state employee. The last of um, the last 16 years, I have spent. I'm serving my community as a worker for economic services in my community based um, establishing benefits for Vermonters most vulnerable. Sorry, I'm very nervous. Um, this is VSEA's biggest fight in our 75 year history. So I will um, try not to get emotional and stick to the script. I've drafted probably 11 different versions of this testimony I'm about to give. No pressure, right? Today, I am here to present a proposal on behalf of our over 6,000 members in response to the proposal shared at House Government Operations last week um, for the chair, by the chair and vice chair. First, I would like to remind this committee and those who are watching today that while our pension system is underfunded, we are nowhere near insolvency. We have over 5 billion with a B in assets, the sky is not falling. We have time to slow down this process and be thoughtful in how we act. The approach to which VSEA is choosing to respond today is aimed at eliminating 225 million in additional unfunded liability that resulted in a change in assumptions. Vermont still remains well on its way to meeting its targeted goal of paying off the unfunded liability for VSERS by 2038, just as we had envisioned and agreed to back in 2010. Our proposal was developed by our VSEA Board of Trustees in collaboration and consultation with thousands of state employees from across our state participating in Zoom meetings at lunch evenings and weekends as well as surveys over the course of the last few weeks. Our board voted unanimously to reject the framework currently being discussed in this committee and instead crafted a proposal that recognizes the importance of maintaining our benefit levels and honors the work of our state employees. Now I have to put it up, sorry. I did submit the proposal um, to the committee, so you should have that. Did, the did first you send it? To, um, sorry to interrupt, Amy. Did yeah. you send this to our committee assistant? I thought so. I can I can certainly do that again. Our VSEA proposal, the, the first bullet on it is any final proposals put forth will not negatively impact current retirees or active employees who are within 10 years of current normal retirement eligibility and inactive vested members. Application of one-time monies towards the unfunded liability. We are seeking one-time monies in the amount of 225 million, which is that increase in the unfunded liability we saw over the last year due to that change of um, that the assumption change. We are seeking to designate a revenue source 
that would bring in an annual contribution of 50 million. We are doing that recognizing the impact on the general fund. We recognize the strain and we are committed to maintaining our benefit levels and would like would, would agree to a contribution increase of 0.35 across all groups. We are seeking to create Group G, otherwise known as H305, which would move corrections employees who supervise offenders or work in the facility, our Vermont Veterans Home Workers, VPCH, MTCR, or any other successor psychiatric facility as well as the training personnel of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council into this plan that would offer retirement at 55 or early retirement at 50. The contribution rate and benefits would be the same as Group C. This plan honors and recognizes the work of some of our highest stressed employees. It would work as a routine a retention tool as well as a recruitment tool and is modeled after retirement systems that we are seeing across New England for this specific work group. Group F, we are seeking to incentivize current members eligible for retirement to continue working past their 30 years by increasing their AFC an additional 1% each year. We are offering a similar incentive for our Group C members by um, incentivizing those members eligible for early retirement at age 50 to continue working with a 1% increase to their AFC up to their mandatory retirement at 55. We are looking to pass language that would codify the Burlington firefighters decision into statute, which is language that would solidify um, that pensions are seen or viewed as a contract. We are further, we would like to further investigate and study prior investment, prior investment performance to codify best practices moving forward through an audit and evaluation, conducting an independent evaluation of our pension systems performance using expert analysis con contracted through the auditor's office. The evaluation will identify reasons for the fund's performance and inter independently ascertain and certify the performance valuation and fees of alternative investment managers like private equity, real estate hedge funds and commodities going back to 2011. We want to identify and we, we want to identify alternate and potential investment strategies to improve and stabilize performance. We are committed to having the strongest pension system possible. And we believe that we need to look back and see what has gone wrong in order to develop those best practices. We also, finally, we also wanna look at governance, be governance best practices. And those shall be defined as the recommendation of the study initiated by VPIC. Independence of members to the system on VPIC shall be a priority with no governor's veto. In conclusion, I hope that as this proposal will be considered by this committee, in good faith, as our attempt to advance the pension discussion forward, as with this proposal put forward by the as, the, as with the proposal put forward by the chair and vice chair, these are complex issues, which in our opinion, do not lend themselves well to being decided in the span of a few weeks. It is our hope that today we are starting a dialogue with the General Assembly and your committee specifically that will continue through the summer and fall. VSEA has repeatedly said that we believe that any benefit or governance changes shall be decided over a summer study composed equally of legislators, perhaps members of this committee, and your counterparts in the Senate as well as union members who can give this discussion the focused attention that it deserves. I would be remiss if I didn't attempt to give you all a picture of what the discussion thus far has been like for our members. My fellow state employees and I are exhausted. We have carried the burden of this pandemic on our backs. Every press conference that the governor has, he's getting accolades, but what you don't see are the people standing behind him 
the state workforce has lifted him up this entire time. It is the work of the folks in the field. It is the work of the, the folks at their kitchen tables with their kids screaming that has continued to keep the state running. We are asking you to just take a breath, take advantage of the one-time monies, look at revenue source and give us a chance to do the work that we need so we can secure a pension system that's viable for my children and their children. Thank you for your time. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we can find a solution together. Thank you so much, you. Amy. Um, that I very much appreciate um, the hard work that, that you and your board have put into bringing this uh, idea to put on the table and uh, this set of ideas and would welcome committee members to uh, ask questions. So go ahead, Mike Merwicki. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, I understand this can be really nerve wracking and I think you did great. So thanks for your work there. Um, uh, as a state employee and someone in the union, um, I've been puzzled and hope you can help me figure this out. We've, we took a lot of testimony over the last few days. And one of the things that came up again and again and again was membership testifying that bad investment decisions by legislators have been detrimental to the fund. Now, as I understand it, there are no legislators on the board, pension boards that make, that make up these decisions. Um, I'm trying to get a sense from you as what we need to do to educate them as to who exactly is on the board and uh, who's making those decisions. Thank you, I think it's a really great question and I'll do my best to answer it while I am certainly not someone I would consider to be a pension um, guru. I've become some somewhat um, knowledgeable in our systems and committees and the makeup and all that stuff, crash course, right, under pressure. Um, I think, I think that it is, um, I'm trying to think of how I wanna say this. I think our members are very aware of the makeup of the boards and the governance of the boards. Maybe they weren't before, but this issue certainly has brought things to light. Um, there are union, union representatives on these boards. We have one member on VPIC and we have an alternate. We have two, three members and an alternate that serve on the BSERS committee. We also recognize that the committee involves a number of other people. Um, it's important to have membership on these boards of people who have skin in the game. And I can't speak to the level of expertise, but I know that these people that sit on these boards take their position very seriously. Um, I'd like to see a review, and I think our members would like to see a review or an accountability of the decisions that were made as far as investments. We're dedicated to that process. You see that as part of our proposal. But hindsight is twenty twenty. We need to focus on moving forward so we don't repeat those mistakes. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I, I do want to. I do want to just add the caveat that uh, make no mistake about it. Our members are watching. <laughs> they're educated. They're act. They're activated, and they're looking to create the strongest pension system possible. And I think that we can continue this discussion and come to to find out what that looks like. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Amy, for, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Amy, for coming in and, and um, uh, how shall I say, widening the uh, discussion about where the parameters are and uh, where you think we ought to go. I, uh, I uh, let me um, uh, reduce my question to, to one particular observation you made. And it did come up obviously in the uh, set of hearings. And that was the plea by many members, both on the teacher side and the state employee side to not to disturb their retirement plan. What I'm hearing you say, uh, and what they said was, what, what the chair and vice chair put on the table 
uh, what I was thinking, maybe a little longer, you put on the table not to disturb folks um, who are um, closer than 10 years to their uh, normal retirement under the current plans. And I, I thank you for that because it answers a question uh, I've been repeatedly having, what's reasonable in this if we had to change some of the parameters? Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, I, I don't think it's any easier if you, if you started from ground, <laughs> from a blank slate and tried to create a, a new um, um, benefit, retirement benefit, than slowly moving in a particular direction uh, with the current system, both on the governance side and the benefit side. So I thank you for indicating where you think some of the parameters could be reasonably moved, and I appreciate that. So I'm sorry there wasn't a question in there. I just I just wanted to zero in on the on the what's the planning retirement horizon because that's very important. It's very emotional, and for practical reasons, uh, the uh, actuary folks really look at that because it really defines what the payout horizon looks like. So thank you. Thank you. And I just do want to comment to that, even though it wasn't necessarily a question. I, I feel the need to point out to you um, as a committee that my board of trustees is extremely eclectic. We are 18 members strong and we have a very diverse um, political scope uh, or thought um, from each of those members. The position that I presented today, the proposal that I presented today was not unanimous. Um, our board itself is divided on this issue. Um, so those parameters that I, I um, explained this morning as bullet number one, the 10 year, um, that piece was not unanimous. So our membership sees this whole issue um, as, far, as far as pension reform as divisive. And so our board was really trying to come up with a proposal that would honor the work of state employees, but that number one, that caveat was incredibly divisive and hard to come to. Thanks, Amy. Tanya, do you have some? Thanks, Amy, for being here. I have a couple of questions and one of them does kind of come down to that point. Um, so I know you're asking for a, a summer working group to really dig into this issue and my and I would assume that all of the proposed changes would sort of be things to investigate and not like let's do that and then have a summer working group correct so that's one of the things that we didn't really discuss as far as timeline but the, certainly the priority is to slow the process down we we looked at the application of one times one time money as something that needed to be done immediately yes. we want to capture that before someone else does um, we recognize the importance to expedite that piece we also saw the revenues, we thought that the revenue source or appealing to um, this committee um, to add the revenue piece as something moving forward was incredibly important. Recognizing the strain on the general fund to make the payments, we hear that constantly, the conversation that legislators are saying, the strain on the strain, the strain, the strain. So alleviate the strain on the, on the general fund and create a revenue source. We, we loved Governor, um, Senator Hooker's proposal regarding um, taxing the rich. We certainly understand there might not be an appetite, but we're not married to that. We are, we are open to any designation of a revenue source. Um, the employee contribution, we are dedicated to this process. We, we recognize in order to maintain the benefit levels that we need to show movement. And so that employee contribution, albeit small, 0.35, that will impact some of our lower wage workers in a very significant way. So we felt that that was something that we needed to bring to your attention as something that could potentially be immediate. And then the rest of the pieces were something that we could maybe slow down and investigate a little bit more, but incentivizing our workforce to stay longer by increasing their AFC 1% each year is something important because right now, I'm not sure that um, this committee understands or that legislators understand right now, our members are panicking. They are making life decisions based on a framework, right? The, this isn't even a bill yet. People are losing their minds. I cannot bold highlight, underline, accentuate this fact to you enough. Um, I spoke with a worker yesterday who works in the medical examiner's office, and she spoke to the fact that they have three staff and the, to recruit for that position 
Um, there's only 500. It's a special in the country. It's a specialized field. And that people in that department, there's only three are talking about retirement mm -hmm. and how the wage in the state of Vermont isn't even competitive in the country. We are losing people, not just at the bottom. We are losing people at the top. You're losing that knowledge. So our, our um, proposal, sorry, tongue tied and emotional. Our proposal honors the work of our longevity workers. So that AFC increase is something that's important and it saves money because the longer you stay with the state, the more you're contributing to the system and you're not drawing off it. So let's incentivize, not scare our, our workers, our most seasoned workers to stay. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I'm just trying to kind of understand your, your time frame there. The other question that I had um, for you is I know you pointed to the summer task force being evenly split between workers and, and legislators. I'm wondering if you had, and maybe you don't, but had a more drilled down idea of who you, who specifically you might want to see on that task force. I think ultimately the, the, the split is the most important, but the belief or the thought behind it was we would like legislators, right? And, and the union members to be able to sit down and really flesh through the details and come to not just an agreement, but an understanding. And I think it's an opportunity to continue that dialogue in a really respectful way. So both sides really understand where each are coming from. It's great to be able to testify in committee and be able to talk to you, but this is not the same as developing a rapport over a number of weeks and months and really getting to understand the issue from both perspectives. So for us, the makeup of the committee 50-50 is more important than me telling you, I think it should be this person, this person, and this person. Wonder, awesome, that's really helpful for me. Um, and I just, I wanna sort of clarify, um, because I realized that what I asked was specific people, but I sort of, what I was really looking for is, are you hoping to kind of work for together with the teachers union and the employees union and the municipal unions and like the representatives from across the border? Are you really looking to drill down on a VSEA specific plan? What is it, who sort of broadly like, yeah, sorry. So I can answer that question. Um, for us, Treasurer Pierce's recommendations were really clear. We understood that her recommendations were circled around a target of meeting 225 million in savings. The proposal or framework, whatever we're calling it, um, that's currently be being discussed in house government operations, I'm not sure what that target is. I'm not sure if it's reform. I'm not sure if it's 225 million in savings. So I think in order to be able to have these conversations and determine the work groups around it, we really need to figure out what is the target? Okay. Are we seeking reform to our systems? Are we seeking savings? And if there's commonalities, absolutely bring the, bring the stakeholders to the table, bring the municipal workers and the teachers, right? But if it's not, if it's something specific to the VSERS system, then that focus work should be VSERS members as well as legislators. Awesome, thanks so much. Thank you. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Good morning, Amy. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to meet you even from afar. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in that a, a couple of, and I'm not sure how to frame it, the proposals or discussion points that you brought up today. Um, have you been able to quantify what, how those would affect the different pensions as far as ongoing uh, potential liability, current costs, so we don't have access to an actuary. I know it's hard to believe, right? We don't all have access to these professional number crunchers. And I'm not sure you would want me to come up with the numbers. I could barely budget my uh, checkbook. But there was a little bit of work and discussion very early on in this process with the treasurer. Uh, VSEA started speaking or having dialogues with the treasurer on the pension issue just after November. And we had looked at running um, a very a various number of scenarios that incentivized as well as um, tried to find savings. So this was part of our initial discussion as far as incentivizing group C and group F to stay longer, the increase in the AFC. The work around group G, that has been one of our legislative priorities within VSCA for a number of years. Um, initially when we had looked to try to cost it out, it looked like it could be potentially cost neutral. I can't quantify that, um, but the savings from Group G, moving those folks, those high-risk folks into Group G, 
um, would impact recruitment intentions. So we believe that some of the savings would come from those costs as well as their increased contribution. So I, I'm sorry, I don't have a form, more formal number okay. <laughs> for you. Maybe someday we'll have actuaries, but not today. <laughs> Thank you. Mike McCarthy. Hi, Amy, I really appreciate you bringing a proposal to us. I mean, I came before your members at a dinner back in January um, and you know, the unfunded liabilities are scary. Uh, what a lot of your members are doing with the work right now and serving Vermonters is also really challenging in this time. So um, I really appreciate your willingness to come and put some things on the table. That's amazing. Um, it's been uh, it's been a lot of time of us talking about one proposal and not having um, the feedback from you all. I just wanted to ask a little bit about the $225 million bullet point. Um, We've been talking a lot about what the state, what Vermonters are going to put into the pension systems this year. Um, you know that increase across the VSERS and VSTERS system is about three is over three. Uh, it's over a hundred million um, in additional dollars over last year. It's um, over three hundred million dollars total. Plus, we've put another one hundred and fifty million dollars of you know sort of freed up money, new revenue for a total you know state across the two systems uh, of. Um, employer contribution this year of um, over $450 million if, if everything went through. So I'm wondering where that $225 million, you know, in your proposal, does that include the additional money that is in sort of the, the budget this year, that additional $100 million ish does is it just into the VSER system? So if you could tell me a little bit about what that money is as a bullet point, because it just says one-time money. Thanks. Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, so we saw the the application of one-time monies in the amount of 225, because that's what we as VSERS experienced in unfunded liability growth over the last year. Um, and we are under we are under the understanding that that 225 million increase to our unfunded liability was caused for a number of things, but the majority of it, I believe, was like 183 of it million was caused by that change of the rate of the change of the rate and rate of return as well as the change in the assumption so as workers we are um, pretty upset to think that that would be looked at as our responsibility to to um, pay so we were seeking one-time monies um, I know $225 million seems like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But when you look at the fact that we have over $5 billion in assets, almost $6 billion in assets, that's really just a chip off the block. We were hoping or seeking that that would be applied or, or found to be applied to our unfunded li liability for the VSER system, um, whether it was the one-time monies coming from federal relief to states. And I recognize that there cannot be any direct application of that money to our pension system. But we were also thinking there's other ways to get creative with one-time monies, whether it's law settlements through um, the state's attorney's office or one-time monies through other different funding, um, funding rewards that are coming through to the state, sales of real estate. So we are looking to you to be creative, to try to find solutions to um, achieve that 225 million that we saw literally overnight after a rate, rate change in um, assumptions. And that is in addition to the monies that you're putting in. And we recognized that there is strain, right? We recognize and are grateful that the payment was um, put into the budget, but you know, now's the time. It's there's a lot of money coming into the state. And if pensions are the issue, then we need to take care of it this time, take advantage of this time. I've used this reference before. I was a firefighter. I know you can't tell, but for 10 years, I was a level one firefighter in Morrisville. And when you pull up on scene and there's a raging house fire, do you apply the water on the raging house fire? Or do you say, hey, look, there's a flower. Let's put the water on the flower. New programs are great. But when there's one-time money is available, you put out the raging house fire. You don't take the time to plant a flower. You could do that when you free up the general funds next year that was applied to take our care of the unfunded liability. There was one more point I wanted to make, but now I'm thinking about being on the fire department. So sorry, I, I would be, I'm losing my mind a little, sorry. 
Um, thank you, Amy, for uh, for coming this morning and sharing and also giving time for committee questions. Um, it is 10 o'clock, so we do need to shift gears to the next um, idea that's being put on the table. But I, again, I will welcome members to reach out directly to Amy if they have questions. Um, and uh, certainly this will uh, this will be the start of a conversation, not the end. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. All right, so committee, um, next up on the morning's agenda is uh, a, a familiar face to many of us, um, someone who, uh, who sat in these chairs, served in this body in the past. Um, so welcome Cynthia Browning. And um, if you have a presentation to share with us, that would be fabulous. I know that many folks um, have seen the written testimony that you have already submitted, but if you have something new, please please do tell us and um, leave time for some questions. So welcome, Cynthia. Thank you so much, good morning. Uh, yes, I did submit a testimony. I know that you may not all have had a chance to read it. I will review some of the points relatively briefly, and then um, I will try to make a few more additional points. I did listen to the testimony on Monday from state employees and teachers and the distress, the heartfelt concerns and anxiety is very, very clear. I would put it to you that it is because of such concerns that this committee needs to continue to work on this topic. I believe that the treasurer is correct that the current structure of the retirement systems is not sustainable. And the idea that it's going, what's laid out now is going to happen is really a kind of an op optical illusion. And it would be better for state employees and teachers to have reduced retirements that are reliable than have an illusion. I know this is not fair. There's nothing about this situation that is particularly fair. But in order to make this program work, I think we have to face reality. We all have to accept our responsibilities, even as we assert our rights. And we have to allocate state resources using those principles. These Retirement systems are shared obligations. Yes, they are defined benefits, which puts the risk and the cost of unexpected developments on the state. However, it is clear that the expected costs were greatly underestimated and the costs that are currently foreseen are just not gonna work for the state. I think it's really important for people to understand that, that since 2008, the state has been putting in full required contribution and in many cases, more than the full required contributions. And yet now we are further behind in terms of funding these systems than we were when we started out. Even if we made no changes in the systems and somehow managed to fund them as they are in the new evaluation. This kind of reevaluation could happen again. And it's just not gonna work. Since when I served in the legislature, I began in 2007, so right about the time that the first this big reevaluation happened, I have seen more and more of the state's budget go to these systems. The spending for these systems has crowded out spending on school construction with the result that we have a backlog, on affordable housing with the result that we have a crisis. Um, it has crowded out spending on broadband with the result that we have grave inequities there. So it's been very, very difficult. The state has a profound obligation to, um, to fund these systems, but it's not the only obligation that the state has. And it has to balance this obligation with other really profound and grave obligations as well. I also think it's important for the beneficiaries to understand 
that if the state is not able to support Vermonters and to invest in projects that will fuel economic development, the tax revenue to fund these systems will not be there. Contracts are renegotiated all the time. Pension contracts in particular with private, private systems when you have uh, a bankruptcy or a municipal bankruptcy, the pensions get renegotiated. I think it's really important to renegotiate the system before we get to that point. I don't believe states go bankrupt, so that's not the issue. But at some point, it's just not gonna be politically possible to fund the systems as they are. I see this as due to three things. One is the underfunding of the, the contributions by the state back in the 90s, which everyone is aware of. It is worth pointing out that at that time, the funded ratios were high. In other words, it looked like there was gonna be enough money. So, um, you know, I can't pretend to go back and understand why they did that, but it's worth noting that. We now know that those funded ratios were based on assumptions of returns on the invested fund it did not materialize. The other factor is, of course, higher compensation at retirement and greater longevity of beneficiaries, both of which are really, really good things. <laughs> but you can see how that's going to greatly increase the cost. And even if we had made the full contributions earlier, we still might not have the cost. The rate of return is really important because usually about two thirds of every dollar in pension benefits is supposed to be from returns on invested funds. So the fact that that was low for so long is, um, is really important. And, uh, and then the, so there's the rate of return, the, the demographic characteristics, characteristics and the state's um, underfunding. But again, since 2008, we have fully funded and more and we are further behind. We can't keep doing this. And I, I'll just point out to, to one thing, a couple of things that the uh, retirement costs that are put in the education fund, the retirement costs of current teachers went up by five times between last year and this year. So it went from 7 million to 37 million. That's about four cents on property tax rate. It's being absorbed this year because of the curious combinations of federal funds and changes in costs. But will it be able to be absorbed in future years? Will it go up by 400% in future years? I just really think that what the beneficiaries may find is that the cost of the retirement may start to press on the cost of their compensation. And I think they really have a balancing act here. So history is important because it informs the present and the future. I think that some version of the changes that the committee has proposed or that the treasurer has proposed need to be put in place to try to keep the state's obligations about where they are now. But I think one of the, the things that I would ask the committee to, to explore is whether there are ways to put in place kind of insurance provisions, provisions that would allow, um, allow for flexibility in the future and make it easier to come to an agreement now. Now I wanna give the treasurer um, credit for some version of this idea I think page three of her report. She talked about um, something along these lines but she talked about if things go better than we expect, that the benefits would be shared between the beneficiaries and the state. So the state would contribute less and, and the beneficiaries would contribute less. I would, I would like to say that suppose we had a situation where the funding ratios started to look really good for a period of time. And I would say maybe some of the redu reductions in benefits or increases in contributions could be partly reversed, but the state's contribution would stay the same. I would try to put in place a provision that half of any budget surplus, whether it's a planned budget surplus or a surplus at the end of the fiscal year, has to go to these systems. We've been kind of doing that anyway, but we need to put that 
into into the into the statute, I think. But the other thing that needs to be in there is should we have another reevaluation that explodes these costs again, we have to renegotiate again. And I would be making the um, the allocation of additional funds, the $150 million that I believe the chair had referred to the other day, I would make the allocation of those funds to pay down the unfunded liability conditional on agreeing to some version of these, um, these reforms. So, so I think that the, the you know, I don't have um, insight to offer about the details of the reforms, you know, the questions of, of the uh, years to retirement, the vesting, the, the POLA, I, you know, that's very complicated to figure out how much are you saving and is it really, you know, is it really going to work? I think that if we could provide some kind of insurance provisions that would help to um, reconcile beneficiaries to the current changes because they would know that if things got better, they would um, get some of it back. Um, I, I think that's a promising idea and I would encourage you to speak to the treasurer about exactly what she meant when she said that um, in the report uh, because she might have some ideas about how that might be structured. You know, one of the, one of the characteristics of representative democracy is that there's a tendency to always want to spend more on programs and to always want to cut taxes. There's great reluctance about cutting spending. There's great reluctance about raising taxes. This means that when you put in place a new system that you want to fund, there's a kind of a tendency to lowball how much it's going to cost. And it doesn't have to be a nefarious thing. The people that put in the high interest returns to be expected earlier weren't necessarily acting with ill intent. But to my mind, when you're, when you're, when you're agreeing to obligations, you have to lean against that. You have to really be conservative in the assumption. And this framework is a lesson in why you should do that. Because otherwise, things are going to cost way more than you thought. And it's going to create problems for everybody. I also want to point out one thing that's um, mentioned in my testimony that uh, that I think is important because it kind of highlights that there's like this, this this is a political process, as all of you know. My understanding that it is that in in 2000 and in 2002, the teacher's retirement system was made more generous in terms of the vesting period and in terms of the state share of the health benefits without any increase in contribution. And at this time, the funded ratios were pretty high, despite the fact that the state hadn't made the required, the full required contribution. So one of the, one of the dynamics you can see is when funded ratio ratios are high, beneficiaries push for greater benefits. And, 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 and that's the dynamic that's happening here. This is a risky system. And it's kind of as if we've lost bets here. I do think it's important to realize that we have been through 15 years of really unprecedented economic times. I have never seen a time when interest rates were this low for so long, interest rates on conservative investments like bonds, I've never seen this. It tells us that unprecedented things can happen. Never occurred to me we have a pandemic recession. Unprecedented things happen. 2008, 2009, the worst recession since the Great Depression, and that was when the interest rates turned low. So there are forces at work that are beyond our control, and that will continue to be true. I would urge the state and the beneficiaries to try to make changes in the system, change the things we can control. And then if the future is better than we think now, find a way to improve the situation of the beneficiaries. But don't just put it off. 
you know, I understand the call for uh, more study and more study can be a good thing. But from my study of this issue, and I've been looking at it since 2007, it's not gonna change the essential dynamic. There's not gonna be money coming out of thin air. We need to be realistic now and create something that's more reliable, more affordable for the state and more reliable for the beneficiaries. And then if, if we can put in place those insurance provisions, if things are better in the future, the state can give back. Uh, I know that the question of more revenue is discussed um, and I understand that, but um, I think that any call for additional revenue would have more resonance and more support if the beneficiaries were also contributing. Yes, I know they already contributed in 2008, but remember the state has greatly increased its contribution and that means all taxpayers. Um, I don't know the details of the proposals uh, that are being made, but I think we need to be careful about going to more revenue if we're taxing people who are very mobile because we could end up just losing revenue overall. So I really think this is a shared obligation. I think the burden is on the state. I think the state has been doing its best to live up to the burden, and yet we are now further behind. This is not where we would choose to be. But I'll come back to what I said at the beginning. It's the very intensity of the distress that you heard. That's the reason why I would, I would implore you to keep working on this. I would implore you to see if there's a way to create a package of changes that's flexible enough so that people can still within it, live within it. If you can create insurance provisions that can protect the beneficiaries and the state in case of further changes. I think if you don't do that, I think that this system will crash and burn at some point in the future. And that is not something that the beneficiaries deserve, nor do the people of the state. So I think that um, I think that I will, I will stop there um, and uh, I would be happy to answer questions about anything in my testimony uh, today or in the piece that I gave out. But I would just again mention the idea of balancing conflicting obligations. Both sides are right to assert their rights to make the state to make changes and the beneficiaries to say, wait a minute, we deserve what we were promised. But Beneficiaries can't deny that if the money isn't there, they're not going to have what they had in the original contract. And the state can't deny that the beneficiaries should be protected as much as we can. So as everybody asserts their rights, they also have to fulfill their responsibilities and face reality and allocate resources based on reality, not on what we wish were true. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us this morning, Cynthia. Um, committee members, any questions about what you've just heard? Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Browning, <laughs> uh, could you uh, give us a, a clue, a question that has come up in my mind several times because of the financial uh, unfunded liability, the suggestion is that we, Wall Street, may in fact uh, take a different view of our uh, uh, issues of new debt, bonds, et cetera, from the bond bank. Do you have an idea if we uh, face some kind of downgrade, whether it's from AAA to AA or A neutral to A minus? How many basis points are we talking about? Uh, increased in our borrow rate uh, if that should happen, say, in May or June. Do you have an idea? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Anthony. I can't give you a figure about that. I do know that based on my reviews of the Capital Debt Affordability Advisory Committee uh, report, Affordability Advisory Committee report, 
this is something that all the bond rating agencies are looking at. And uh, I think they are, one of them already downgraded us a little bit and they may downgrade us again. I am not somebody that worships at the feet of these Wall Street agencies. I would just remind everybody that they didn't see the financial crisis coming. They rated many of those instruments very highly. So they're not, they're not wizards, but they have a lot of power. Right now, interest rates are very low. Even if they downgraded us, I would imagine we could still borrow at a reasonable interest rate. It, isn't, it doesn't mean it isn't something to bear in mind. It is, because one of the problems here is that the unfunded liabilities of the pension are you know, billions of dollars. Our whole outstanding state bond debt is like 600 million. So the, the pension obligations completely dwarf our outstanding bonds. That's why it's such a factor for the rating agencies in terms of whether we can meet our obligations, whether we're gonna be unable to um, that make payments and such. One of the things that's interesting to me is that when I joined the legislature in 2007, that was when the moratorium on state-funded school construction happened. And that was when the reevaluation of the pension system was going on. And since that time, the capital bill went up during Irene, after Tropical Storm Irene, but it's been going down. We're borrowing less and less unfunded liabilities are crowding out investments that need to be made for Vermonters. So I don't have an answer for you as to the basis point. I'm sure they will take it into account. And I'm sure that if we don't do something, they will downgrade it. That means that future borrowing will be more expensive. The debt service will be higher in the budget. Um, but that is, to me, the real reason for dealing with this issue is to better secure the retirement and to be sure that the state is able to fund all of its obligations, not just this one. Any other questions from committee members? All right, thank you so much, Cynthia, for the time and thought that you have put into this and for coming to, to share those thoughts with us this morning. I would welcome committee members to follow up via email um, if you have any other thoughts that you'd like to uh, bounce back and forth with uh, Cynthia. And Cynthia, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. And I would urge you to check with the treasurer about the idea of this, this idea of insurance provisions of some kind, because she may have something, uh, she may have something good in mind. So I would encourage you to follow up on that. Thank yeah. you very much. Yep, it's a good item to flag. Um, so committee members, uh, we're gonna take a five minute break. And so I would welcome you to mute and turn your camera off and we will be back.